I V M. Storytel is an audiobook platform that lets you hear hundreds of thousands of stories on your mobile, PC, wherever you prefer. Now, generally, Storytel is a great deal at $2.99 a month for an unlimited number of books. But for our listeners, we've got something special. The first month for IVM listeners is now just $99. Bucks. That's an insane deal. It's $200 off the first month. To start you off, let me recommend one of my favorite books, Range, How Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. It's a book by David Epstein and is one of the most thoughtful books I've read recently. He talks about early specialization and why that's not necessarily the best way to go in a modern world where problems are not always simple and viewing them from multiple lenses are helpful. In the Indian context where we're forced to choose science, commerce, or arts in the 10th standard, I think this is particularly applicable and it's a great read. So go to storytell.com slash IBM. Go get your first month at just 99 bucks and check out Range by David Epstein. Great read. Welcome to All Things Policy a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru. And we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. Uh, as you are aware, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman unveiled India's union budget for the financial year 2021-22 in the Parliament of India on February 1st. However, there was no mention or a statement on the allocation of the defense budget. This is despite the ongoing standoff with China on India's northern borders, which will complete a year soon. Thus, a thorough review we thought of the India's defense budget is very much merited. To discuss this, we have Takshashila's researcher Pranay Kotasthane and Lieutenant General Prakash Menon, who is also a head of Takshashila Strategic Studies cohort with us. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Before we deep dive into defense budget, Pranay, could you briefly explain what is budget estimate, what is revised estimate, when do we look at revised estimate, how do we make sense of these terms? Right. Uh, thanks, Suresh. So this is interesting because uh, until a couple of years back, defense budget made it into the news only on two days of a year. One was when CIPRI, Stockholm Institute of Peace Basic Research Institute, which basically comes up with a report on military expenditure. So whenever it comes out on a comparative expenditure across countries, it used to make news. And the second one was the day of the budget, union budget. So these were the two days when defense budget used to get discussed and all other 363 days, uh, there is no mention of defense budget. But this year, things changed because of what is happening on the northern borders and there was a lot of focus on it right so given that as a backdrop it's important to realize that the budget statement which gets made uh, has three components to it so for example the budget statement which got made on 1st feb talks about what is the planned expenditure in a variety of areas including defense starting from 1st april 2021 to 31st march 2022 right uh, so the this is what they expect to spend over the course of next year. But as you know, that things can change during the course of year. And that is what precisely what happened last year, right? Because budget was made on 1st February 2020. And then the world just changed because of COVID, right? So obviously, the expenditures that were committed on 1st Feb 2020 couldn't be followed. Some had to be increased, some had to be decreased, so on and so forth, right? So along with the statement that gets... Uh, uh, that proposes what will be spent in the upcoming financial year, the uh, budget documents will also present a revised estimate. The revised estimate is basically this budget making process would have started October or November last year. So by that time, they would have already had numbers for what was the actual expenditure during the course of the last financial year. So revised estimates actually take into account of those actual uh, expenditures which happened and and then they extrapolate that number to th March 31st of uh, this year, so the end of this financial year, right? So those were the numbers which were presented. Uh, so that is the second big number which uh, needs to be noted. And then along with it, there are audited statements of the financial year, which is completely over, which got over on uh, Feb March 31st. 
2020. So we now have the audited statements by the CAG uh, on that. That also get presented during the budget uh, session. So we have three set of numbers, actuals for 2019-20. We have revised estimates for 2020-21. And we have a budgeted planned expenditure for 21-22. Uh, and I guess this is very relevant for defense because what China and India are involved in in Ladakh, the revised estimates uh, changed significantly from what was budgeted in uh, the last budget speech, which was made in Feb 1, 2020. So I hope that gives an overview of how it is structured, Suyash. Yes, yes, Pranay, definitely. Thank you so much for this. Sir, I want to come to you. I Before the deep diving into specifics like defense pension or capital outlay, I would like to get your opinion on the broader picture for this year's defense budget. Yes, uh, the fact remains that India's geopolitical threats have definitely increased, especially with China. And therefore, the budget in normal case should reflect the enlargement or the expansion of those threats, which in my view, it does not. Of course, there are enough justifications in terms of the state of the economy itself, the COVID-19 and the political economy which from which decisions are taken. So first, I think this budget can be described as more of the same. What you see as additional expenditures in the revised estimates for 2021 merely reflect the ongoing tensions on the northern border. So it is also unfair to just look at one budget and then talk about the amount of money being put into defense. But on a larger scale, therefore, for more than a decade now, the contributory share or the percentage of money spent on defense in terms of GDP has been coming down. And not only that, the percentage on central government expenditure has also been declining, which goes to show the political choices and the priorities of the government. So the question is, does not India's geopolitical ambience need a greater emphasis for money into India's defense? And I think the answer is yes. And I think looking for this budget and budgets before it, the politicians don't seem to have reacted to that reality. Of course, there are many issues of detail, but I am speaking in general terms that one of the first and the most important parliamentary responsibility is about the consequences of protecting India's defense. And although the political economy is always a challenging space, the challenges of geopolitics don't seem to be reflected. And I think that is a matter which we need to look at. Thank you, General Menon. Uh, Pranay, would you like to focus on the larger picture first before we deep dive into pensions and uh, capital outlay? No, uh, nothing. Just one point to add to what General Menon said. Like uh, he mentioned about how defense, there is no proportional increase in the defense expenditure. So just as a backdrop to that, like if even if you look at the constitutional division of responsibilities, the first five items in the union list are squarely in the domain of defense, right? So it is, uh, it just indicates that this is the primary responsibility of the union government. And the fact that we are talking about defense expenditure being deprioritized over time, over the last 10 years is uh, deeply worrying, right? It shows that the primary responsibility that the union government is supposed to do, they are sort of veering away from it and other challenges or other responsibilities are crowding out what the importance of defense lies. So that is one point. And I think, I guess the big picture uh, in terms of this year's budget, I'll just run through uh, some numbers. So one thing that we need to keep in mind is that although, you know, defense minister was quick to thank the PM and finance minister for increasing the defense budget number to 4.78 lakh crores. Uh, if you see the reality is 
a bit less encouraging so if you compare it with this number this 4.78 lakh crores is just 7000 crores increase over what was budgeted in the last speech right that is feb 1 2020 so it's just 7000 crore increase and even within that if you compare with the revised estimates which was the real sort of expenditure which happened because of what happened in china from compared to that number actually defense spending is set to decline by 1.3 five percent uh, in the uh, upcoming year and this despite the fact that the situation with china hasn't resolved right so we are going to be facing that challenge again but spending as is set to actually decline a bit by 1.35 percent so i think this is a big picture number from this year's budget Thank you. That's a very specific detail. I'm sure a lot of us are not aware of this detail. So that is something that we will definitely look forward to in a relative context. I want to come on. I'm slightly intrigued by what General Menon has said. I would like to first start with. I was supposed to start with pensions first, but I like to start with capital outlay this year. Uh, as Pranay, you've already pointed out, I think there is 1.4 percent of increase in defense budget this year. Only 1.4 percent of increase. However, the capital outlays have increased by by over 18 percent. So uh, this is obviously with keeping China in mind. but uh, as you have already pointed out uh, the additional expenditure that went in last year in relative terms there is a decrease in this year's defense expenditure so how do we make sense out of this can you break down the numbers for us and uh, this is certainly looking at china in mind but how do we break down this expenditure Yeah. So first of all, uh, uh, Suresh, actually, defense spending hasn't gone up by 1.4 percent. I said it has reduced by 1.35 percent over the revised estimates. Okay. So it has overall number has gone down. All right. So and if you also include inflation, etc., these are just nominal numbers. The decline will be much bigger than 1.35 percent. Right. So that's one. Now look at two big components. Any component uh, in any expenditure is can be divided into two things: revenue and capital. Right. Re- capital is basically what you spend on resources that can be used over a long period of time. So when you build assets. those are called capital expenditures so for example if you purchase drones that will be capital expenditure whereas revenue expenditures are expenditures on uh, running the show so for example if you spend the uh, spend on maintenance of a drone it comes under revenue expenditure or if you spend on uh, salaries and pensions it also comes under revenue expenditure all right so this is like two a big broad distinction uh, in all budgets uh, of government of india now if you look at capital outlay first now uh, what i said is that although there has been a decline marginal decline of overall defense spending by 1.35% there is a significant change in the composition of this expenditure so what we see is that revised pe- pension expenditure in the last year actually went down by nearly 9000 crores while capital outlay increased by nearly 20000 crores in the same period so this is an interesting uh, thing right in the last year when all things were happening with china capital expenditures went up and pension expenditures were went down so uh, went down so this is an interesting thing to look at right so let's dive into it uh, first if you look at the capital expenditure a lot of news reports that i read are saying that uh, government actually spent a lot on emergency purchases of uh, you know precision guided munitions or drones to counter china right so now i that that was the news which i read but i am not convinced if that's the case because even if this is the case maybe drones were purchased it w- doesn't explain a jump of nearly 20000 crores these will cost much lesser and second also that even if they cost uh, more it's not as if we pay all this amount up front defense expenditure acquisition takes multiple years and all these payments are done over many many years right so that's where what i want to come to that actually this rise in capex is accounted for two items one is naval fleet which is a uh, close to 5000 crores and uh, second is uh, 
other equipment of the air force which is nearly 10000 crores and then there are aircraft and aero engines which the navy bought uh, which is again and uh, close to 4000 crores right so out of the total 20000 crores 19000 crores is accounted by what was spent additionally in the navy and the air force right so now uh, that doesn't mean that suddenly there was an increase in the expenditure this year right we didn't hear any of the big ticket items that are going to be purchased in the last year actually this increase that you see can probably be explained by the fact that these are payments of equipments which are already purchased so as i told you all these purchases happen uh, payments happen over multiple years so probably this is payment for what the navy would have procured many years back and what air force has also been procuring especially rafael also since 2016 so this is what accounts for this jump in the capex and remember standing committee in 2019 has had observed that uh, our budget allocation for modernization didn't meet these committed liabilities themselves right so forget the question of buying new equipments whatever was allocated in the budget was it fell short by nearly 60000 crores for committed liabilities so what has actually happened is that probably the government has increased spending on committed liabilities so as to not default on its already made commitments and that's why you see a jump so i think it's too early to say that you know this capital expenditure is because what is happening on the northern borders thanks prana that's very precise and that's why at takshashil avi say that the devil or the uh, or the real picture lies in the details as prana has already pointed out breaking down the numbers and looking at past all things that have happened including what prana pointed out at standing committee observation is very important to understand a larger picture i want to focus on capital outlay is a bit uh, general menon uh, as prana has pointed out a lot of capital expenditure has been committed to the naval and air force fleet modernization or the previous commitments or the liabilities that we had so what does this tell us on a strategic picture for a long term and though the standoff is happening on the northern border where army and air force is involved the focus has been over the past few years and in this budget on uh, navy and air force so how do we make sense of this sir so i would think that actually the increase in the capital budget would have a mix of emergency purchases and having to pay up for committed liabilities what is the percentage of the mix of course we are not aware of so the point is that the emergency purchases itself would add on now to because you defense equipment is not available off the shelf most of the things that you buy you probably pay up till it delivered it takes time so i would think that going forward this year or the next financial year there would be an increase in committed liabilities and that is for sure so the point is that as far as the capital budget is concerned the increase merely reflects india's scramble as we always do when there is a crisis to go ahead and buy or new equipment as a much that should be the major part apart from covered liability but coming to you, why is the air force and the navy now here i have to assert a guess because i am not aware of the details but i would think that the reason why it is so is because most of this equipment which they buy are not sourced from india they are from foreign vendors if it was a different psu then you'll ask them you'll pay them later keep it pending and ask them to deliver but you can't do that in terms of foreign vendors and especially the air force increase i'm sure would have to do with a lot of sensors and missiles and night firing stuff and so on so i would think that the reason why air force and navy has increased is because we had to pay up and that's not the case with the dps use but this is a guess mm. i would just add that even if you see structurally 
anything that navy and the air force purchase will be like uh, really capital heavy because you know if you're buying uh, <laughs> things like support to the uh, naval uh, carrier group or things like that right those will be really costly whereas uh, expenditures on armed forces are revenue heavy because it's primarily the uh, humans who are at the borders right so that is a difference uh, so structurally if you see uh, capital expenditure numbers uh, if you see as a proportion of what is an uh, armed force spending on revenue versus what is it spending on capital always uh, navy and air force will spend higher on capital but i guess this year the increase again like general menon said is probably because of committed liabilities and the fact that we have are we are paying for things which we've already purchased in both the navy and the air force that's again an interesting point pranay and also jatin menon because uh, numbers can sometimes be deceiving so uh, i would like to ask one more question before we move on to defense pensions uh, so uh, as we go on the structure of warfare is changing or the nature of warfare is changing and we are going towards modernization informatization so where does the money for these changes come in from or how do we make sense of this so th- there is a lot less money being spent on research or acquiring newer technology oriented weapons so uh, how do we see defense budget in this aspect general menon or pranay anyone can take up see i would think that the fatal character of war obviously what you said is that the digital revolution is the is making an impact but uh, the fact is that these are all layered onto existing systems so we are not able to see a budget and separate as how much of money is being spent on a new layer which is primarily the world of cyber or the world of space and we are not able to make out how much is going there i don't think uh, the budget detail which we have can give us an idea of of such an expenditure unless of course pranay was able to read the budget better no those such details yes gentlemen and won't be there in the budget documents okay okay so uh, both of you have studied uh, i move on from cap sorry go ahead pranay uh, yeah just uh, one point to add here not from a warfare angle but the fact that we need to create space for modernization and how can that be done right so for example the 15th finance commission report which was also tabled on the same day provides one way out and the way that they mentioned is and this has been a demand of the ministry of defense from a long time is to create a non lapsable uh, fund which can be used to do modernization in the future now the problem that happens is as i told you this defense purchases happen over multiple years so what used to happen is ministry of defense has said that we are going to uh, we need 20000 crores for bu- buying xyz platform and actually that purchase doesn't happen in that year or because of uh, some things it is delayed that money used to go back to the consolidated fund of india and then the next year they would have had to apply for it again right and then again the gov- ministry of finance has to look at competing demands from so many ministries and all that so that had led to a structure where over time we are not even able to meet our committed liabilities forget about new schemes for modernization so as a work around to that the idea that was proposed was that build a non lapsable fund which stays with the ministry of defense and that can be used for modernization and payments for new capital acquisition now the 15th finance commission has actually recommended how this can be done they have mentioned about what is the money that can be parked in these funds so for example they start with some money that needs to be committed by the government of india itself uh, second is uh, by the ministry of defense itself by selling land uh, or selling dpsus or ordnance factory boards that are uh, not working as desired so these are some revenue uh, generating opportunities that can be used to seed this fund and and this fund builds a corpus that can be used in the future to do more modernization in whatever ways right so we don't have a statement from the government yet about what it is going to do on this uh, 15th finance commission recommendation so that is a space to watch but i guess that is one at least one way out to create some fiscal space for modernization in the future 
uh, Pranay. Uh, but I find from the statements of the secretaries in the finance ministry, this doesn't seem to be a given. They might have different ideas about it. That's the impression that I get. Yes. Yes. So this is just a recommendation. So 15, finance commissions make recommendations and not all of the recommendations get heard by the union government. So we don't know whether this will actually happen or not. Uh, but this is anyways a possible way out that needs to be discussed more. Okay. Uh, I move on to the final question for this podcast. Uh, that's on pension. Uh, that on that is on defense pensions. Uh, this year we see a drop, strangely a drop in defense pension outlays. How do we make sense out of that? Pranay, starting with you. Yeah. So that is the most intriguing part, and lots of guesswork has happened. So as I said, the revised pension expenditure went down uh, nearly by nine thousand crores. So this is puzzling because pension expenditures are uh, predictable before time. It's not as if uh, you know suddenly uh, there are a new number of. Uh, people who are added or anything like that, right? So you know how much you have to pay. So how can it happen that revised estimates actually went down by 9,000 crores? I can, now this is all guesswork because we don't know the reality. So I would say a sudden drop can only happen if there is a change in uh, one of these two factors or both of them, right? One is you should reduce the number of retirees or you should reduce the number of uh, the pension amount that is paid to each retiree, right? So uh, actually, Actual amount paid is a multiplication of these two. So either you have to decrease one or more of these two factors. Now let's break this down, right? How can you reduce the number of retirees? Now that can only happen where some people are reporting in the news that, uh, you know, there is a new scheme in the works where the government is going to increase the retirement age. Now they are saying possibly because of that, this ex- revised expenditure number has gone down. Now that I am don't find convincing at all because nothing of that scheme has come into light as of now. And even if it is going to be implemented in the upcoming year, you will see that drop in the budgeted estimates of the next financial year, right? You wouldn't have seen that decrease in the revised estimates of the year, which has already gone by. So So uh, there you should have still seen an increase. So I'm not convinced by uh, this explanation of reducing uh, the number of retirees. The second part, if you look at reducing pension amount per retiree. Now, there are a couple of explanations in that. One uh, explanation is that there has been a freeze in dearness allowance, which is causing a reduction in this outgo per personnel. Uh, And this uh, freeze was planned before the pandemic hit, right? And that was planned to control expenditures. Now, again, this is not explanatory because a decrease in uh, DA would not, would probably affect pay, but not pension amounts because pension amounts have already been fixed uh, long before and they have not been revised for the last four, five years. So again, I don't find that how can a decrease in DA actually affect pay uh, pensions that is not very clear the another speculation that is being made is that previous years payments actually in, included some arrears that uh, have been compensated already and hence this year's pension expenditure will go down now if that were the case i again can't understand why the budgeted estimates of the last years included this uh, arrears right because you would know this whether there are arrears to be paid before the budget of 2020 was made itself so again this is not very clear why it has happened so what is the most convincing explanation I can give at this point. And again, as I said, it is speculation. It is just that the government is trying to book these pension commitments over multiple years in light of the fiscal situation. So what they are doing is probably pay some amounts this year and then carry over the expenditure to the next financial year and so on and so forth. Right. So that is probably what explains this sudden drop. Uh, But we need more information on this and none of the budget documents will talk about it. So uh, probably we'll have to wait for the standing committee report and discussions on this. General Menon, would you like to add something? Yeah, as a pensioner, actually, I've, you know, I asked around whether people have got arrears last year. And the only arrears which were paid out was to the uh, medical corps, who especially, and there's a very small number of doctors who were, through a Supreme Court ruling, where uh, they were given, as far as their pension in 
to calculate the non-practicing allowance, which was not calculated for them in the armed forces. It was done for the civilians. So they've got some areas on that account. That is the only areas which has been paid. So I joined Pranay to really uh, wonder how can it be possible that such a large amount of money be reduced from the pension uh, disbursement. I would think that this would be a question which the finance minister would be asked and we probably have to wait, wait a reply and I'm sure that they would reply and it would be more, and that's not very uncommon, uh, budget or bookkeeping sleight of hand. So, you know, they can actually book it this year, they can book it next year, they can do a whole lot of things. So I think it belongs to one of those categories. Otherwise, there is no rational explanation. Yes, Pranay. I would just like to add, uh, Suyash, actually, General Menon and I both have been working on defense pensions uh, for a couple of years. And overall, we do want the pension amounts to be under control, right? Because that has a direct effect on reducing the space for uh, capital acquisition. But what we've been arguing is that you can only do that over time because you don't want to suddenly change the commitments to pensioners who already exist, right? That would be a real breach of contract contract and uh, as a sovereign state it would also doesn't uh, augur well that you have reduced uh, pension amounts of commitments you've already made right so the reduction of pension is a requirement but that has to happen over time through mechanisms like probably b better lateral induction or through mechanisms like moving people to uh, the new pension system instead of the OROP etc but that all those uh, savings will happen over time. But just sudden drop in pension expenditure is uh, inexplicable and that can only happen by actually reducing the number of retirees or by somehow uh, reducing the outgo per personnel. And both of those solutions are not uh, good for our defense preparedness. So I would just uh, caution that uh, reduction is good, but it should be done in the right way and over time. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, just before I conclude recommendations, I would first like to go ahead with a uh, with few recommendations. Uh, General Menon and Pranay has been working on pensions. Do check out their documents and work on pensions. Some of the links will give in this description uh, of the podcast. Uh, also, after the budget came out on 1st February, Pranay has written in a couple of places. Uh, you can also check that. Uh, Pranay, would you like to briefly give some recommendations on how to read the budget and how to make sense of, of it, uh, in, especially defense budget? Yeah, defense budget, probably a good place to start is the budget documents itself. So I would urge people to actually go to the uh, India budget website and then check the Ministry of Defense's demand for grants and expenditure. I think there's a lot to learn from there itself. And many people have written about the defense budget, so that's easy to find opinion pieces. But I think the real value is actually going into the budget documents and analyzing what has been the expenditure on DPSUs, what has been the expenditure expenditure on pensions and I guess people can bring out a lot more insights than I could on the 1st of Feb. So with that I'll stop. General Menon? No, I, would, I won't want to add anything except to the fact that I think while uh, uh, the demands of the political economy can be overwhelming, I think that the parliament and the executive need to actually pay attention to these resources which need to be allotted to defense and i think that's a larger thing which requires to be addressed okay with that note i would like to thank both general menon and pranay for helping us understand india's defense budget for more such informative podcasts keep on listening to all things policy thank you thank you sir thank you if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website, takshashila.org.in.
I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Storytel and TheWholeTruthFoods.com. So, great week on the network. Number of really, really interesting shows for you guys to check out. Here are a couple of the ones that I would like to highlight for you. Check out This Round is on Me. Gauri Devi Deyal talks to her husband, Jay Yusuf, about mixing business and pleasure. They're the husband and wife part business partners at Food Matters Company. Give it a shot. Really fun show. On Nankari, they speak about Chaat, the queen of the street foods. A fun episode. They canvass the beauty and romance of street food, its cultural importance in a city. And they also discuss the unfortunate harassment that street vendors sometimes go through. On Pesa Vesa, we had Madhu Chanda. They join Anupam talking about the budget and the different aspects of it. Storytellers and Storytellers features Shreyansh Pandey, creator of Kulak, a great conversation and some interesting insights into facilitating and nurturing writers. Do check that out. On Thale Harate, the Kannada podcast, Mansi Prasad spoke to Pavan Srinath about the history and appreciation of Indian music. It's a really interesting conversation. They discuss classical music and how it evolved in India, what are the various musical instruments and how they develop. Really, really fun, interesting stuff. And with that, I hope to see you again next week. پیش خدمت ہے آپ کی شان میں ہمارے انجمن سے ہائی آئی ایم صدف اینڈ آئی ایم ارشد کھانے کا اتہاس اکنامکس پالیسی سائیکولوجی سب ہے مینیو پر اونلی آن دا نان کاری پوڈ کاسٹ ایوری ونسڈے صرف آئی وی ایم پوڈ کاسٹ ایپ یا ویب سائٹ پر یا پھر جہاں سے بھی آپ اپنے پوڈ کاسٹ سنتے ہو 